here. Um, I this has been a passion project of mine for a really long time. Uh, I ended up doing my master's degree capstone project at Syracuse University for my master's in public administration on this topic. And um, I, I'll never forget when I was a reporter at Channel 13, I visited Fairport High School. And I went there because the, this um, advanced placement class developed their own sort of Facebook social network internally to do studies together. And I thought to myself, this is awesome. And then I thought, well, this is terrible because uh, their counterparts in the city probably couldn't do something like this because the kids don't have access, the same access. So it was really important to me to, I'm actually going to pick this up, it was really important to me to kind of study what it would take to, um, it's tied. <laughs> oh, it's tied, okay. So just to really um, study what it would take to have a municipal broadband network. Um, and the reason this is important, the reason internet access is important is because to fully participate in society, civic, educational, recreational, economic activities, you need access to high-speed broadband. So first, let's figure out where we are. When we talk about lack of, access, of lack of broadband, usually we think of rural areas, and that's where politicians are focused on, and it's a lack of access, because these places, they don't have internet at all. They have no way to connect even if they want to. In urban areas, what we experience is a lack of adoption. We have, we have people who, pretty much everyone in the city of Rochester can subscribe to the internet, but, that, but they don't. And here's what we find. In Monroe County, about one out of five households does not have broadband internet. In the city of Rochester, we're talking about almost one out of every three households, and this is according to the census. And when we talk about broadband internet, we like to think of wired internet, hardwired internet as being the, um, the, the gold standard, it's the best, it's the fastest. For wired internet, no wired internet, you're talking about 28, 29% in Monroe County, and almost half of households in the city of Rochester have no wired internet. So what's going on? You have a decent number of households that are smartphone only. The only broadband internet they have, oh, thank you. The only broadband internet they have is their smartphones. Well, what are, what are some of the limitations of smartphones? Anyone? Don't they, don't they limit the amount of data you can Yes. Download? Well, there's that. And also, can you do a research paper with a no. smartphone? No. No. Your eyes get blue. It's, you know, your smartphones have, uh, yeah, this, and not all computer websites work well with smartphones. So you have 12% you have of households in the city register are smartphone only. And then you've got a, a number, uh, you have an equipment problem. You have a number of households that don't have computers. So we're talking about 27,000 households in the city of Rochester. 27,000, all the people who live in those households who do not have broadband internet. And one survey had us as one of the worst connected in the country. Well, let's look at the root causes. Why don't people have internet? Well, poverty is one reason. Uh, you can see that the uh, subscription rates directly correlate with poverty. Uh, almost half of households who earn less than $20,000 a year don't have internet. Um, and then you see the rate goes way, way down as income goes up. Let's map it. If we, the darker the area, the higher the poverty. And the darker the area, the higher the no internet rate. You can see a correlation when you map it. Well, education's another, another issue, okay? It's not just poverty, you're also talking about education. Um, when you go less than high school, you have more people without internet. More when you have people with college degrees, fewer people without internet. There's a correlation when it comes to education. Well, let's take a look at the, the marketplace, which we were just talking about the marketplace. A lot of people complain that we sort of have a monopoly. That's not really true. Uh, it's technically we don't have a monopoly, but what we do have is product differentiation. As frustrated as we are with Spectrum, it really is still the best in the market if you don't have green light available to you because it is the fastest. 
and it is widely available. Spectrum, though, is $65.99 a month. It does have a discount program for lower speeds. Well, first we should back up and say what FCC defines as broadband. 25 megabits per second download and 3 megabits per second upload. Spectrum does have a discount program for like $14.99 a month, but there's so many barriers. And studies show that most um, low-income families don't know about these programs, don't take advantage of them, or they don't meet the criteria. you got to have kids in school. You can't have a current account. You can't be in arrears on any accounts. So there are significant barriers to joining this program. Then there's Frontier Internet, which is significantly slower, and also it doesn't perform as well. Uh, DSL, our own our phone lines, very heavily dependent on location, and the further you are away from the hub, the slower the line. And uh, for $45 a month, you can get the 45 megabits uh, per second. That, that's, not, um, that's not considered consistent with DSL. That's the problem. Greenlight. Well, if you look at a map of where Greenlight is located in, in this county, it looks like the redlining map yeah. from the 1960s. <laughs> Uh, green light is not, uh, is not going to come to my neighborhood in Beechwood. It's not going to come to places where there's not a lot of homeowners willing to subscribe with capital. How does green light go to your home? So green light, um, green light requires a number of easements. Green light um, is, is, uh, wants a number of neighbors to sign up together and then they'll come into your neighborhood because it's got to cobble together uh, it's got to cobble together a plan to come in and do the capital work, which is very um, expensive. And then they put a wire into your home? So they would, so if, when you get cable, they just go right up to your cable, the telephone poles. It's a very similar process. And then, of course, we have the smartphones, which we discussed the, cap the limitations of smartphones. Smartphones are $70 to $90 a month. It's more, and, and, and the higher end is those unlimited plans, which you would need if you were smartphone only. And they throttle heavy users. They will slow your internet down if you are a heavy user. And we already said they have limited capabilities. So these are our options. They're not great options. $65 a month for really the best option. It's great. Monroe County has something else, has an asset. Since the 1990s, We've been building fiber. We've been laying fiber when we do these sewer and road projects. We have thousands and thousands of miles of fiber strands, and 80% of them are unused. They're just laying dark. Monroe County owns it. No one's doing the 5G now? Well, we can talk about 5G in a minute. Yeah. So the county in 2016, 2017, we paid a whole bunch of money for a group called Magellan to come to Rochester and do a study of what we did. We built this network, what is it, what do we have, what can we do with it? And Monroe County took the study that they produced and put it on the shelf. Mm. Well, they showed it to me for my study. No one's ever seen this before, before I did this report. And what this, what this study recommended is that we have a robust fiber network, and it should be upgraded to what's called carrier class. That means other entities can jump on. And they, they suggested that we start with other government and public entities and public institutions, such as schools, town halls, village halls. And that would earn revenue for the county and would also save money for these partners. The Magellan suggested that the city and the county combine their networks, create a broadband improvement plan, because our need for broadband is only going to increase over the next years and years and years. So Magellan suggested, why don't we come together and create our own network? And they suggested that we form kind of a governing body called a public network entity that would have a board, would be a nonprofit type, type of board with a number of government entities on there who would run this network and make rules for it and make sure that and make sure that um, it was in, that there was enough investment and it was running properly, et cetera. Now, once you build this carrier class network, what might we do next? Hmm. <laughs> We could possibly open it up for other uses, like municipal broadbands. Is there any other place doing that? Other, other cities? Yes. Yes. I don't get into that. I don't get into that in this. Um, I do in my report slightly. I don't in this PowerPoint presentation. I will tell you that Chattanooga, there, there are hundreds of municipalities around the country that have varying models, which I will get into some of the different models that we might, um, that we might uh, explore. 
But um, yes, there are so many different things. And Erie County, as a matter of fact, their county executive wants to spend $20 million to build the backbone network that we already have. Mm. So other communities want to get in on this. When you look at evaluating what do we do to solve this problem, there are some things, there are some criteria that we have to look at. This is the, sort of the boring part, but it's sort of food for thought as we say, we want municipal broadband. Okay, well, what does, what does that mean? And what are problems are we trying to solve? So first you want to look at efficiency. Uh, so, what a, so a solution is considered efficient if it can provide internet to the most people at the lowest cost. And then there's effective. It's effective if it increases the number of people who have internet, the most number of people. Then we're talking really effective. It's equitable if we're not leaving people behind. If, if a solution is equitable if, 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 if we can do this without uh, having haves and have nots. It's administratively feasible if it's not super complicated, right? But can government pull this off? And it's politically feasible, of course, if we can get the public and the politicians on board. Let's look at our alternatives then. What are the possible solutions? Well, we can look at municipal broadband. And what does this mean? There are several models of municipal broadband. The one that you might that most people might think of is full service retail. Government owns it, government operates it. I pay my bill to government like I pay my water bill. Another option is a public-private partnership. And this, this involves sharing the risk with a private entity, a private company. And that could be maybe the private company comes in and builds the network, uh, the last mile of the network. Maybe the private company comes in and does the retail portion of the network, just sells it and operates it. There are so many different ways that a public-private partnership can work, but essentially it's government basically saying, look, we don't have the expertise to do this, we need a partner, we need a vendor, and, um, and, and we also don't want to shoulder all the risk. Another model um, has to do with the technology. Fiber to the home is considered the wonderful gold standard. That's where every single house is wired, whether you're using telephone poles or the ground. Fiber to the fiber um, doesn't get old. Fiber is super fast. It's the it's the best we have, um, and fiber is also the backbone to Wi-Fi networks too. Wi-Fi networks are a little less reliable. The FCC thinks we need both, and we need um, both smartphone and fixed internet. But um, fiber to the home is definitely super expensive. Wi-Fi is not as reliable. So one thing. Yes. Why is it not reliable? Because I have Wi-Fi in my, sure. my house and it's pretty reliable. Yes, but if you're talking about a Wi-Fi network that would say blanket a neighborhood, it, it's less reliable because of weather, distance, number of people who might jump on it. Um, it's just much more prone to little things going wrong with it other than your, your own fixed connection in your house. When you're talking about a whole bunch of people jumping on a network that's relying on poles outside, you get into a little bit of a different scenario. But there's there's Moore's law, so it was hard to do two years ago. Yes. It might be perfectly yes. okay. So equipment today. is def equipment is definitely improving. Um, there is no question. Also, speeds are a little slower with Wi-Fi too. Um, but yes, you are right. This could um, this could totally be changing in years to come. And one thing. I mean, Wi-Fi is going through the same changes as three G, four G, five G. There's eight oh one. Correct. G, uh, you know, higher and yes. higher numbers. So one thing, though, that um, the Magellan, the, the author of the Magellan study, when I spoke with him, one thing that he cautioned me, because I used to be this really big fiber to the home person, but one thing he cautioned me was communities fail when they let the technology drive the solution. So kind of like what you're saying. Don't get so fixated on you want Wi-Fi or you want fiber to the home or you want this one certain technology. You have to be focused on the people. And we'll talk about that in a minute. You have to be focused on what's the best thing for the people involved, and then let the technology dictate that. So dictate, you know, what the people want, dictate the technology that you choose. Well, another policy alternative that is not as popular with me anyway is why don't we just try to work with the existing service providers and try to get them to just do better? Um, so we could try to negotiate with them to offer discounts. Well, get this. The Rochester City School District tried to work with the city when the franchise was up for Spectrum to get them to offer $9.99 internet. And the city said, we will cover the cost 
with Lifeline will cover the cost of $9.99 internet. We will register families ourselves, and they tried to get the city to make this um, uh, uh, contingent on the franchise, and Spectrum said no. And that was the end of it, and the city didn't even try to negotiate it. So the, the city was just, just $9.99 a month and was going to have lifetime do it, and Spectrum said no. So working with service providers has already proven to be a very difficult thing to do. It has not worked in the past. And as I've also mentioned, people don't sign up for their discount programs. Um, you can also, we can also try to negotiate with internet service providers, maybe to provide free internet in some high poverty areas. Um, my, my hunch is that wouldn't work, but also, okay, there would still be a lot of people left behind. So you'd have winners and losers. Maybe one group one for six to one would be the winner, but then you'd have 19 more be the loser. Is that really an alternative that we want to explore? Or we could just do nothing. Status quo would do nothing. We could wait for the private marketplace of new digital technologies like 5G to come up. We could rely on philanthropy, which is what the city school district is doing. The problem with relying on philanthropy is, well, we don't control that. It could end tomorrow. The problem with waiting for new technologies is when 5G shows up, it's still going to be really expensive. That doesn't, that's not really going to solve our problem. And the status quo option, doing nothing, is definitely the politically most feasible. Like, that's definitely the thing that our politicians want us to do. <laughs> well, as part of my project, they wanted us to score the alternatives. Well, you know, we just little rug and came out on top. But <laughs> rating, our, rating them, given the criteria, you know, municipal broadband, it's, it's not the most efficient. Um, it's, it's certainly very effective because I do think it would reach a ton of people and it's definitely very equitable. It's not really administratively feasible and it's certainly not politically feasible, but it still comes out okay. We can work with current service providers which scores low on everything except, well, it's very administratively feasible and it's definitely politically feasible. Or we could do nothing, which does nothing for efficiency, effectiveness, and equity, but is definitely administratively feasible and definitely politically feasible. Um, in my paper, uh, I have municipal broadband coming out on top, but as you can see, didn't, it was, didn't blow those other alternatives away, because this is a really complicated thing. And now we're going to get into just how complicated it is. When, when you're talking about municipal broadband, we can talk about how much we want this and how, much it will, how wonderful it will be for, for all of us, but you also have to consider the political considerations, the practical ways, how are we going to do this? And the one thing you have to do is you have to map all the people and entities involved and put them on a scoring chart. So we have them from high to low on the power scale, and then we have on the bottom the interest scale. Are they pro-municipal broadband or anti-municipal broadband? Look, I have all the powerful people under the anti-municipal broadband, with the caveat that I don't know if the count, where the county executive is on this. I wrote this paper when Cheryl Dinalpo was our county executive, um, and she shelved this Magellan study, so I'm assuming she was very anti. Yeah. But, um, I don't know where Adam Bellow is on this, and I'm very eager to talk to him when he gets more settled in. Certainly on the pro side, we have a lot of anti-poverty organizations. I think this is a real um, benefit to us, our MAPI. I think there are organizations that can really, um, really help. Um, and I just, I don't know how to go backwards, but anyway. But you get the idea. I mean, one thing you have to do is really look at where are people. So here are our challenges, and we're going to get into each one of these challenges. The challenges to implementing municipal broadband, political support, financing, planning, public support, socioeconomic factors. Some of our enablers are this wonderful network that we already have, and as I mentioned, the anti-poverty organizations. Let's look at the political support. Look at this number, $831,000, you know what that is? The campaign donations that our local officials and the governor have received uh, since 2013 from Big Telecom, AT&T, Verizon's charter. Uh, fiber tech, which is, which is the commercial provider, um, the, this, is, this is a big barrier, frankly. And um, frankly, our local political parties, more so than the politicians, except for maybe no, our local political parties um, rake in a lot of money from big telecom. So the Democrats and the Republicans are taking in a lot of money from these entities. A lot more from developers, I think. Yeah. Real estate developers yeah. are huge. Um, I do believe that we would see them uh, eclipse this $831,000 number. Um, real estate developers are huge. Absolutely, that's, that's a very important topic, and uh, um, it's one that I'm also kind of heated about. So so what, how much is this thing gonna cost, right? So financing, uh, when, 
how much it, we don't know how much this is going to cost, but we have an idea, and it's not pretty. Um, the, the Wi-Fi option, the city school district actually did a study in 2016 and found that you could, you could do a Wi-Fi city network for 20 million. It would cost about $3 million a year to operate. With fiber to the home, you're talking really big bucks. It could be 40 million to 80 million dollars, depending on what existing infrastructure you use. But potential sources of funding, Empire State Development, Community Development Block Grant Funds, and of course, bonding. But let's take a look at some of the other infrastructure projects that we've done in this community and how much they cost. Uh, are we really talking about a project that is that much more money than what we typically spend on other infrastructure projects that benefit um, not even as many people in some cases? Another, um, another issue is planning. How do you even begin to start to plan something like this? Well, there have been studies of other places who have implemented uh, municipal broadband, and here are some things that they suggest. Number one, you've got to set a goal. What exactly are we trying to accomplish here? Are we trying to bridge the digital divide and get people who can't afford internet connected? Are we trying to do an economic development project, which I actually think municipal broadband would also help, but that, that's a little bit of a different problem to solve. What are we trying to do here? We also have to look at what can we do, right? What, is, what kind of money do we have available? And what are we good at? What, are, what is our expertise? You also have to design the network once you start to answer these questions. Hey, what's the geographical boundary? What kind of service are we going to provide? What's the technology that we're going to use? You, uh, then you determine what the demand is and the operational needs. What do we need to run this thing? And then you just repeat the process. You deploy the network and you repeat the process every time you want to expand. Another challenge is public support. It is vital to include stakeholders in your planning, participation from your target population, because one thing that other communities have experienced is that you, you, you tell people, we want to do internet, we want to give you internet, and what do they say? I don't need internet, I, I can't buy groceries this week, what are you trying to do to me? I don't want you to spend that money on internet, I need, I need other things right now, I need a job. You know, stop, stop trying to force internet on me, I need, these other, I need these other things. So it's really important to include people in this planet. You also need to be flexible. You know, you might go in thinking you want to do one thing and come out saying, you know, it's not really what we heard from people that they need or want. And you have to be flexible. You also have to have realistic expectations. You need to make sure that when you're communicating to the public about what it is you're trying to do, you can't tell people the internet's going to solve all of our problems. The internet's going to improve our graduation rate. The internet's going to help you get a job. You have to be really realistic on what it is you're trying to do and don't oversell this thing. If you oversell it, you're, you could find a lot of really disappointed people who then won't trust technology and you've created a tremendous amount of damage. You have to deliver on, on your prop. Yes? Yeah, but they have to understand that if they have uh, broadband internet, they don't actually need a phone. Right. And we, um, and, and I do get into that and when I talk about the socioeconomic factors and some of the things that you need to talk about digital readiness. Yes. Um, you have to deliver on your promises. If you say you're going to build the darn thing, you better build it. I mean, if you if you promise something that you're not going to deliver on, it's it's a problem, and people aren't going to trust you. And how do we know this? The fast ferry effect. Um, that's actually a barrier. This community doesn't like big projects. And what do we call everything that's big and bold? The next fast ferry. <laughs> oh, next fast Yeah. So the other challenge is, um, as you suggested, it's the socioeconomic challenge. People, um, especially people without uh, education, may not be digitally ready. They may not try, They may not know how to use a computer, or may be embarrassed and might not understand um, what the internet can offer. So you, you really have to um, combine any internet offerings with digital readiness um, outreach. There has to be a lot of outreach involved to say, here's what the internet can do for you. Here, you know, here are some ways that we can help. Whether it's we have to do the digital readiness piece, you have to do the equipment, and you also have to market it. So let people know, hey, this is available. You can't just build a Wi-Fi network and turn it on and flip the switch and not let anybody know about it yeah. and how to, how to connect. You can't teach people who don't know if you don't have it available. If, if it's right. not there, then they can't get a computer. It needs to be part can't. of the deployment. Yeah. It all has to be part of um, some kind of deployment. And we have the infrastructure to do all that. I mean, this community is good at marketing. I mean, I think we can do that. Um, 
you know, and then if you're gonna, you really have to lead this thing, and you have to make sure that you are bringing the community along with you. You have to be transparent. You have to build a coalition. Make sure you're communicating the vision. Have to empower people. What I would like to see is a task force, um, a countywide task force, to study what is, what do we have to do here. What what do we what what can we do? Um, and the first thing is really examining Monroe County's network and seeing if we can follow through on the Magellan study by upgrading it to carrier class. So my ultimate recommendation is to do a municipal broadband network because I really believe that it would um, tap the potential of our entire community and lead to other really great things. And that is my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.